Hey guys, I'm at the American Space Museum and I interviewed a launch photographer who has captured over 600 launches. Imagine you are a rookie photographer about to have your big break into the business. You're shooting on film, so there's no room for error. Oh, and your target is a moving rocket. Your first assignment is on January 28th, 1986. Unfortunately, this will be a launch no one will forget. You witness the loss of seven lives and you are officially a Cape Canaveral photographer. That's exactly how veteran photographer Carlton Bailey's rocket launch photography career began on the Cape almost 40 years ago. Now, over 600 launches later, he's still out there capturing the magic and sometimes unpredictability of the rocket launch business. I am joined by Carlton Bailey. Carlton Bailey, correct. And I don't know, you know something about taking pictures, right? Um, I, not as much as I'd like to. I go into every photo shoot going like, if I don't learn something from this, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, I, I either nail it or I learn something. So, been doing it since second grade. I bought my first camera at a church rummage sale for 25 cents, an old Kodak Eastman pony. How long have you been taking pictures of launches, though? Uh, well, I shot my first launch, would have been STS-8 which was a night launch. I did that as a tourist. Five, we have engine start. Two, one, zero. We have ignition and we have liftoff. Liftoff, 32 minutes after the hour and the shuttle has cleared the tower. I had honed my school skills with animals working in zoos and aquariums and things. And then I got into the space and the first one I shot was STS-8, a night launch. Had no clue what I was doing. And they came out. I mean, they're, they're for film, it was pretty good. And then shot 625, give or take a few launches since then in 37 years. Over 600 launches. Over 600 launches. So what have you learned about launches with all that experience? Always expect the unexpected. Never go into it thinking it's gonna be routine. If anything can happen, it could. The most of the, the, the best thing you need to learn is hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. It might be a two minute delay. It might be a two months delay. It could be a two year delay if the right thing or wrong thing happens. So yeah, you, you got to be patient and you got to find another way to make money because there's fortunately there's enough people to cover it and all, but it's, it's not a primary source of income, which right. most photographers will know, yeah. unless you get a Pulitzer Prize. You were telling me about your moonshot because I showed on my channel recently a, a recent moonshot and you were explaining one that you took, was it 22 years ago? 22 years ago. Uh, we were covering an Atlas II launch uh, out on the Cape. It was going from pad 36 and it was a night launch and we were all lined up. They, we had a, a mound, a little hill that we could all set our tripods on. And there was a clearing in the trees that had kind of been cut off. So you kind of, everybody would line up. It was about a 20-foot line of photographers and their tripods. And they went into a delay. And they're holding. And 45 minutes after waiting and waiting, they go like, okay, we've resumed the count. So we all get there, and you're not you're, you're oblivious to what else is going on because you just want to go home at that point. And they get down to zero, it launches, and mind you, this is still the days of film. Mm -hmm. And it launches, and it's going up, it's going up, and then something miraculous happened that you see through the viewfinder, and after it was out of view, everybody kind of looked at each other, go like, did that just go through the moon? And, but with film, you have no idea. Now, the gentleman that was about two or three feet to my left, who's from Orlando Sentinel, had one of the newfangled digital cameras. Oh. It was like three megapixels. He looked at his picture, and indeed, the rocket had gone right through the moon. You know, we had the film settings down pat. Digital, not so much. So his digital, when the flame went into the moon, kind of blew the moon part out mm. and the rocket was kind of blown out. So it wasn't a real good exposure, but it was a moon going through the rocket. Mine was 400 speed film and I keep the film in a safe 
to prove it if I ever need it. Anyway, it goes right through just to the right of where his rocket went to the moon. The flame was just outside the moon's surface, so all the nooks and crannies and hills and valleys of the moon show up. You can see the venting on the upper stage of the rocket. Nobody moved, nobody had a GPS, nobody had a little computer going like, hey, I gotta move 15 feet this way. You put your tripod down, you took your chances, and you had to wait till the next day to see what you got. Right. Oh my and gosh. for 22 years, I was safe and going like, nobody's ever gonna do this, and then somebody invented an app. Oh my gosh. Somebody, but I had a good run, uh, but I can still say that I got it no computers, no internet, no apps. I got it because we were stuck where we were told to stand and took a picture. And wow. that was kind of lucky. So when you see photography today with all of the advances and all of the kind of, you know, bumper lanes or whatever, like, do you almost feel like it's cheating a little bit or no? I could say it's cheating. They shouldn't be able to do it. I think in the back of my mind, I'm a little bit jealous because they've got these newfangled, oh my God, Dick Tracy kind. But in a way, I have shot film. I shot film for 20, first 25 years out here. There's things you can do with film that you can't do with digital. Um, I learned with film and I think I wouldn't change it at all. I, I would not want what's out there now to begin with because I would almost feel cheated. Mm -hmm. I had to learn f-stops and film, you know, and everything. I had to learn what that M was on the top of the camera. And nowadays, like I said, you, yeah, the app tells you exactly what to do, where to set, where to stand. It's still photography because cause I don't know how to use those. Right. So it's, in a way, yeah, I, no, I would not change a thing. Uh, what was your favorite launch to cover? Well, it's kind of hard to say because every launch I go out there is different. You, you, you go like, oh, I'm too old for this after 600 launches. But that thing leaves the pad. This Artemis went off the pad. I shot a bit. It literally, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps now. Yeah. After 600 launches, I still get goosebumps. Everyone sounds different. Everyone kind of looks different. Right. Originally, I would say my favorite usually is your first launch that you cover as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And that, unfortunately, was Challenger 51L. So it, in a way, it's my favorite because it got me started. But unfortunately, I had to start at the top and work my way down almost. Right. It's not the way I would have wanted my, right. my space photography career to start. I asked John Zarella to recount kind of the day of Challenger. What do you remember from that day? I'm sure a lot. I remember festivities. I remember Kentucky Fried Chicken was there the day, well, the day before they were giving out free chicken boxes because they had chicks in space. I remember looking down, uh, I think the morning of the launch and, and where the NASA grandstands were in, and there was like a an area where they would do their, their press interviews afterwards and seeing this girl going like, well, I didn't think teenagers, school kids were allowed out here. Turns out the more I looked at the picture after the launch, I'm almost positive it was Barbara Morgan. And I remember it launching and when the boosters broke off and went their separate ways. Now back then, the VIPs, all those people were in the press lot, parking lot. So you had the press down there with their cameras in the faces of all the families and everything. When those boosters broke off, everybody clapped and cheered. Because when you see these things on TV, they always center deep into the shuttle. You don't see the big picture, as I like to call it. So when you see the thing on TV, you see the shuttle and you see the boosters peel away. So when this thing just went into this massive cloud, which was the tank burning up, the, uh, the booster going through the tank and igniting the hydrogen oxygen, and then the boosters came out, those people that didn't know exactly what was going on was clapping and cheering, thinking this is the way it was supposed to be because they saw the boosters peel off, there's a huge cloud, who knows, then the shuttle was gonna come out of that cloud and keep going into space. 
and what came out of that cloud was trailing debris. A few minutes later, we saw something on the horizon that was on a parachute. And we're like, could it be the crew cabin? We're like, no, it's a crew cabin. They don't have a crew cabin. It's a pressurized crew, but there's no parachute. It's not survivable. But wait, the military's been using the shuttle. The military does things that they don't always tell us about. Maybe the military put a parachute in there. Is it? Turned out it was the nose cone frustrum of one of the SRBs that we saw that had been on one of the SRBs that they exploded. It was not until 4 o'clock, 4.15 that afternoon when they lowered the flag to half staff was our first actual uh, notification, if you want to say, uh, there, that they were admitting that the crew was gone. Um, it was back when we had landlines, there was no internet, no computers, the entire southeast phone system was down. It took me two and a half hours just to get a line out on a pay phone. It's, it, you're, you're stunned. Uh, I remember taking my video camera at the time, pointing it, I filmed the launch, and then I never shut it off. I just pointed it directly at the countdown clock, which continued to count up. And so I've got this 30 minute live, as it happened, video of the PA telling you exactly what's going on, and you see exactly to the second because the countdown clock is in the morning. And I, you know, I still, it's, it's, it was a horrible way to start it, and I, to this day, go on like, that's not the way I wanted to start. I wouldn't be standing here talking to you, perhaps, if it hadn't gone that way. Right. But when you realize that you just saw seven people die, I went into shock, I think. I think I, we mentioned this, because I the next day, I was in shock to the point where I went around every bookstore, magazine store, everywhere I could. And it, it's gonna sound embarrassing, but you gotta, if you're not there, you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I searched and searched for a newspaper that did not have a headline saying Challenger was exploded and everybody was killed. Because I couldn't believe that it wasn't a dream. And then, you know, it, it hits you. And for the first eight to 10 years, I stayed inside firework. I could not watch a firework display because you'd see that go up. Mm -hmm. And then when you saw it burst and you say all these things coming back down, I would have these flashbacks of, of Challenger. So it was, it was traumatic. It still touches me to this day. I, I sat down, the guy that I was shooting for said, we got you, um, you know, credentials, because he asked what my qualification was. I said, well, I've been doing year-end reports for the zoos. I uh, have a zoology degree. I got my own equipment. I live 20 minutes away. I work real cheap. He says, I've, I've, I've never gotten a resume like that before. You got your own equipment, you work cheap. And he says, you're hired. So I did a story about the re, re, uh, you know, opening of Pad 39B. And he says, oh, great. You got badges for the next one. Go in. It's a, it's, it's a teacher in space. It's going to be a circus. It's going to be a zoo. Learn how to read backwards, upside down, doors open, closed. Because in three weeks, you're going to have to know how to really write. And you're going to have to know how to take good pictures for me. But we're going to give you a pass on this first one so you can learn what to do for me. And in three weeks, you better know what you're doing. Well, I didn't have three weeks. I had like three days. Obviously, we both saw Artemis. How would you describe it um, since you've seen so many? Like, what was different about it? It was, to me, again, everybody sees it differently. And I've seen your video of how you described it. And I have never, I don't ever remember hearing a launch ever of everything I've seen out here ever that loud. Now, that has a lot to do with the air, the weather, the humidity, clouds, and everything. I, I could feel my insides reverberating. And you want to stop taking pictures to look, but then you know you're not going to get anything. I, my phone was on video. You're trying to do this and that. I went back and looked at the video, and I posted on Facebook. It shows this night into day effect. And 
It's you can read newspapers by it. Right. I up until it was the strangest countdown ending of the countdown re re picking up the count that I've ever seen out there where they go the, during the do they did the poll and then all of a sudden we're, we're getting ready to pick up the count at 10 minutes usually after they would do a poll on these rockets they go we're doing a poll and get ready at my mark to pick up the count and then usually like five minutes or seven minutes to make sure everybody's ready and this time they just went well we're going to do a poll they did the poll and they said, okay, launch director, you're giving the green light to go. And the grid launch director is like, you know, okay, we're ready to go. So uh, everybody get ready to pick up the count at T minus 10 minutes and we're counting. And with that, my friend Mark, he didn't even have his stuff out of the car, I don't think. Oh I had the stuff there, but it was covered because of the dew and everything. You're running out there, you got seven minutes now to do this and do that. And you've had 12 years to plan for it, but then all of a sudden you got seven minutes. And then you're looking, go like, oh, we got three minutes. What's going on? We're not this. And you're checking, you're checking. And the adrenaline starts flowing so much, and you're so concentrated. You don't get to watch the launch. You don't get to see the launch right. because you're seeing it through a one inch by one inch eyepiece. And they always say, if you see it, you didn't photograph it. Yeah. Because if you see it, that means the shutter didn't snap shut and you didn't get the picture. And then after it's all over with, personally, I don't feel like I've been breathing for like eight minutes. You just go like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. And nothing can ever, no, nothing prepared me for that. Yeah. That, I miss the shuttle days, but that, the ripples, it's not just a roar, it's this waves and waves and waves. Yeah, it lasted for a long time. And if you watch the, the, the solid motors, they burn. It's not like a solid straight yeah. burn. You see the waves and every one of those things is another sound wave coming at you and it just hits and rumbles, rumbles. And after it's all over, you go like, that's yeah. it. And you're like, why do we have to wait two more years? I know, I'm, at least. At least. But, you know, maybe they'll learn from this one. And I have friends that tell me they're already testing the Orion capsule and they're building the Orion. So maybe they've learned enough that they can pare it down to, you know, 18 months, 15 months or something. But again, I've seen enough, as they call them, anomalies that um, I don't want to see anything ever again launched before it's time. And just because we've never had a problem before right. doesn't mean there's always a first time, you know, for everything. So, yeah. Do you plan to uh, shoot the Starship launch? Not the ones in Texas, unless I can find a backer, hint, hint. Um, I'll be glad to go down. The one here, again, I'm not, I'm not as expert as most of your interviewee kind of guys. The one here, they're building it, and I don't know the whole story because with SpaceX, they not they don't usually always tell you the yeah. whole story. The word on the street is they're building it, but they still have not been cleared by NASA mm -hmm. to actually yeah. launch. Because um, if something happens on or near the pad, it's going to take out the historic pad 39A. Right. Possibly, and right now, that's the only way we've got to get humans into space from Florida Scoil right. until the uh, Atlas V and the Starliner, which has now been put off to next April, I think. So if it has a, an accident on or near the pad and takes out pad 39A, our human flight is gone. How far it would go? Would it affect pad B? It could right. take out pad B and then American space program is, is gone. So if you guys like that story, please make sure to like this video, subscribe to Ellie in Space, and I'll see you in the next video.